Hello and welcome to this special edition of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine Middle Atlantic Region Boost Box. My name is Kate Flewelling. I'm very happy to host the Equity Guidelines Trust today for our most popular webinar ever. Uh, today we're joined by Ann Wirt, Lisa Haskell, and Janice Kazmarek uh, from the Equity Guidelines Trust. Before I hand it over to them, we've got a couple of housekeeping issues to attend to. First, you all are muted. We have about um, 300 people registered for this webinar. You can put your questions in the chat box, and the presenters will pause a couple of times during their presentation for me to ask them questions that you've put in. When you put questions in the chat box, make sure it says send to all participants. This webinar is eligible for one Medical Library Association CE credit. You will be redirected when you exit WebEx to the evaluation. This webinar is being captioned and recorded. There is a link to the live captions in the chat box. Without further ado, I will hand it over to our guest speakers today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kate. This is Janice Kessmer from the Agri Guidelines Trust. And um, I thank everybody for joining. Hopefully, you all can see my slides. So today, what we'll be doing is we'll be providing you with just some background information about EGT, or also we refer to it as um, the Agri Guidelines Trust, or EGT. We'll show you our products and services. We'll take you on a tour of the website. We'll provide a little bit more in-depth detail on two of our major project products that we offer and information on how to register and take any questions you may have. Um, prior to actually telling you about EGT, I realized that we don't have a slide on Agri Institute. So, some of you may be familiar with us. ECRI Institute is a 50-year-old nonprofit healthcare research organization based in suburban Philadelphia. Um, we were actually the contractor responsible for uh, the development, maintenance, and enhancement of the National Guideline Clearinghouse, which was also known as NGC, which was an ARC-sponsored guideline repository from 1999 to its closing in 2018. <clears throat> so with that, when we found out about the closing of um, NGC, ECRI decided to take up the torch and develop um, a guideline repository because we knew the importance of what the work we did for NGC was, and we wanted to continue that and actually go beyond what we did for NGC. So ECRI um, decided to develop the EGT, and it's a publicly available online repository of objective evidence-based clinical practice guideline content. One of the things that I probably should have put in the slide, which I did, and is that it's freely available. So it's accessible to anyone who registers to the site. Our purpose is to provide physicians, nurses, librarians, educators, researchers, and other members of the clinical um, community with up-to-date clinical practice guidance to advance safe and effective patient care globally. And our repository is um, accessed and um, we have participating developers from national as well as international guidelines and medical specialty society. So when we were developing EGT after we found out about the closing of NGC, ECRI started to self-fund um, the build of our website. And because we were um, in the news with regard to our efforts, um, there was a lot of publicity surrounding the closing. We got a call from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, who had kept um, apprised of what was going on and said that they wanted to offer us funding for our initial um, launch of EGT. So needless to say, that was a very good day because we don't often get funders calling us um, unsolicited um, providing us with funding. So we are thankful that the, the EGT is currently freely available, part and parcel to this funding that we receive. So what is it that they're funding for us? Um, these items are, um, we'll go in more detail, but briefly, the guideline briefs, which are succinct summaries of full-text guidelines, 
trust scorecards, which are an assessment of the guidelines um, against IOM standards or that um, were developed in 2011 for um, trustworthiness. We provide a monthly newsletter to all registered users. And the Moore Foundation also funds um, a technical advisory panel that are comprised of experts in the field of guidelines and quality measures, methodologists, um, clinical informaticists, um, and clinical physician support, as well as um, patient um, support and patient tools. And they're charged with helping EGT not only um, develop current products, but evolve our thinking as we move guidelines into digitization. So again, what we, do we currently offer? It's um, the succinct summary guideline brief and uh, trust scorecards. And my colleagues will um, not only demo these um, products, but they will also go in a little bit more of a deep dive on these two, so you have a better understanding of what it is that we're, we're providing. We include a comprehensive inventory. So we want to be seen as the go-to resource for current guidelines. So you, as librarians, don't have to go out and access other resources to find current guidelines. One thing that's important when um, NGC was closed, um, some organizations took that content and repackaged it and posted it on their site. But we did not do that for a variety of reasons. One was it wasn't our content to do that to because the guidelines that were posted to NGC, um, the developers gave permission to HR for hosting that information, not with that grade. And a lot of that content was actually old. So out of um, the 1,400 guidelines that were on NGC at the time of its closure, we wouldn't have taken 500 of those because they would have aged out due to currency. So we maintain that currency requirement with EGT. So the guidelines that you're seeing on our site are up to date. They're not old. They're not outdated. And we're not promoting unsafe or outmoded practices. Um, our monthly newsletter is something that, again, our registered users get access to, and we provide in this um, guidelines that we'll be posting to the site, any type of recommended readings that we think are important to our guideline community members. Um, we will be um, posting information. For example, we posted um, our webinar to you folks today at NNLM. We post that to our users, as well as anywhere EGT will be presenting or exhibiting at upcoming conferences. And then last but not least, we provide um, something which is called um, quarterly scorecard analytics. And what this is is that we do an analysis of how our guideline developers scored on a specific IOM standard um, for the CPGs, or I'm sorry, for the guidelines that we scored and post it to our website within that quarter. And then we provide those results. We provide a mean. Um, across in, uh, medical specialties. So again, Anne will be showing you what those scorecard analytics um, look like in a little bit more detail. So that's something that developers are really interested in seeing because they want to know how they are scoring on specific standards along with their um, guideline colleagues within that same specialty area. Our audience. Um, our audience is varied, as you can see, but you can also see that a huge portion of our audience are medical librarians. And um, the other two audience mem member groups that are large are nurses and students. And these students could be nurses, medical students, um, MPH students, or somewhere in between. So how do we know who our audience is? Um, one thing is that when we ask users to register for EGT, we ask them their um, information with regard to their job title. And the reason we do this is we're trying to develop products and tools for specific audience members, and especially for those that access our site as part and parcel of their daily um, activities. So you'll see this. Um, one of the enhancements and features we just rolled out last week was developed specifically with a librarian audience in mind. A bit of our staff, so you know um, actually the numbers that we're currently representing in our repository. We have more than 1,300 guidelines currently. 526 of those have these products, which are the brace and scorecards. 
the remaining 800 and change um, where we don't have the breaks and scorecards, we actually link out either to the developer's website or to PubMed so you have access to the full text guideline. We have 125 developers from national and international societies, 65 of which have these derivative products, which we are calling the breaks and scorecards. Um, we have a global reach, and um, I should have mentioned that we actually launched November of 2018. So we're not even a year old yet, but as you can see, our numbers are up there and continue to grow. And at this time, we have 8,000 registered users. Outside of the U.S., we have registered users from 84 other countries and territories. So before I hand the controls over to Ann so you can actually get to the good stuff, I wanted to pause here to see if there are any questions. You can uh, put your questions into the chat box and make sure you click send to all participants. I'll pause briefly in case there are anybody, if there's anybody typing questions now. What are briefs and scorecards? Actually, we're going to show you what those are, and we're going to take a deep dive into both. And um, basically, the short answer is a brief is a succinct summary of the full text guideline. And as many of you know, guidelines can be 40 pages in length. And what we try to do is summarize them into structured abstracts. The scorecard is basically um, a checklist and a rating of how the guidelines scored against specific IOM standards. And we provide a one through five rating on how developers scored in certain areas. And Lisa will actually be taking that into a more granular level. So you'll see exactly what standards we're scoring and um, the rating scheme. So if you could kind of put it on pause for a minute, we're going to actually get to that soon. Of the 800 that don't have a scorecard currently, are there plans to implement them? Yes. One of the things that I didn't mention, which Anne will get into, because as I mentioned that the content that we're posting isn't content that we created. I mean, we create these derivative products that are based from uh, off of guidelines. So we can't just create these briefs and scorecards without having permission from the guideline developers. So what we do is we reach out to these developers um, whose guidelines meet our inclusion criteria, which Anne will show you. And um, we seek their permission to create these derivative products. So there's two scenarios. One is for those developers that do meet our, our criteria, however, um, we don't have these products created, we're waiting to get their permission to do so. For the other half, their guidelines don't meet our criteria. And again, Anne will show you um, the criteria that must be met in order for us to create these products. A couple of folks have asked, are there APIs for the database? No, not at this time. Can you confirm uh, the cost for the content? There is no cost. This is freely available. Anyone, anyone could register and access the content currently hosted on our site. Somebody asked um, about whether there's a way to provide a link from a library homepage that would not require individual registration. No, individual registration is required at this time. Um, we are investigating API because we know that is a common question we've been asked. Um, but again, initially for startup, we actually needed to create individual registrations in order to find out who our audience was, how far our reach was. And again, this is basically a lot of information we needed to get up front in order to decide who it is that's accessing our content and what do we, what other content do we need to provide to them. So um, as of now, that is, it's still currently, it's individual registration. Does the newsletter uh, notify when a guideline is removed or updated? Updated. We provide notifications when guidelines are updated. We don't provide, at this time, any information of when guidelines are um, archived from the site. Okay. And will you be willing to share these slides? Yes, of course. Absolutely. We'll send, we'll send the link to all registrants uh, to the slides. And um, Somebody asked, it appears that there is information 
on the site that is by subscription only. I clicked on telehealth and there's no free information but 15, 115 items that are subscription only. You're, you know, this person must be on the ECRI website, not the ECRI Guidelines Trust website. Go over the URL. And, and we're going to go over the URL. So, I, I, yeah, we assure you that it, it is a bit confusing because ECRI Institute is the one that is the developer of EGT, but EGT has its own separate website apart from the ECRI Institute website. Do you anticipate um, free access in perpetuity? That would be our plan, but we will have to see. Okay. Um, I think those are most of the questions for now. A lot of them were coming in fast and furious, so if I did not get to yours, um, please do ask it again uh, during the next break. And just a quick reminder from somebody in the chat box uh, to the speakers to define acronyms. And I, I will say I confirmed with the speakers that ECRI itself is uh, not an acronym for anything. No, ECRI is no longer, and it used to be um, Emergency Care Research Institute when we first formed. And since we do so much more outside of that, um, we're an evidence-based practice center, we're a patient safety organization, and we do device lab testing, uh, you know, all these different things. We just dropped um, that and we just use ECRI, which basically now stands for nothing. In EGT, I apologize, I, I thought I said it at first that, um, you know, ECRI guidelines trust, we sometimes just use EGT just um, as an acronym. So. Feel free, though, um, anything else we need to re-clarify, we certainly will. And then, um, as I mentioned, on to the good stuff. Here is actually a tour, so enjoy. Hi, I'm Ann Wirt. I am the Operations Manager for the ECRI Guidelines Trust, and I'm going to take you on a tour of the current website. This website was launched, as um, Janice said, in November 2018. Um, the URL for the Guidelines Trust website is guidelines.ecri.org. You can register for free access right from the homepage of the Guidelines Trust. We provide three informational pages. Um, to both members and non-members who are interested in learning more about the Guidelines Trust. Our About page includes a lot of the information um, that Janice went over in her slides, our mission, our current funder, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, and our current products, which I will be showing you today. Again, quick recap, the guideline briefs, which are summarizations of key elements of that full clinical practice guideline, and our trust scorecards, which are ratings of how well that guideline adheres to the Institute of Medicine standards for trustworthiness. And trust stands for transparency and rigor using standards of trustworthiness. So our second informational page is our inclusion criteria. So all guideline developers who submit their guidelines to us or guidelines that are identified by our team are vetted against this inclusion criteria. We're looking for guidelines that are available in English, online for free or for a fee, and published within the last five years to stay current with practices, that include recommendation statements that address patient care, that are produced by a relevant guideline developing organization, such as the Medical Specialty Society, and that are based on a verifiable systematic review of the evidence where there is documentation of a search strategy, study selection, and evidence analysis. So if a guideline meets all four of these criteria, as Janice mentioned, we will reach out to the guideline developer and ask them to sign a permission agreement. And that agreement allows ECRI to pr produce um, the guideline brief and the trust scorecard. Now, we understand that not all guidelines are going to meet this full inclusion criteria. However, again, as Janice had mentioned, um, one of the services of the Guidelines Trust is to be a go-to resource to search for clinical practice guideline content. So if a guideline meets criteria 1, 2, and 3, we will include the guideline in our search feature. We will not produce a brief and a trust scorecard. However, we will provide a link 
to the full guideline that's available on the developer's website, and I'll show you this on the search results page. Again, I want to note um, that some of the guidelines in the repository, um, we are working with the guideline developers to secure those permission agreements. So you may, there may be a guideline that meets all four of these criteria, but we have not yet produced that brief and scorecard because we're working to secure that permission agreement. Our third informational page is about our trust scorecard. So we provide a lot of information on what are the IOM standards, the tool that ECRI uses to assess the scorecard, or to assess the guidelines, which is the NEETS instrument, and we provide access to that tool, and then all the different standards that we are assessing the guideline. Here you can also access those quarterly trust scored scorecard analytics that Janice had mentioned. Again, we are providing these to let our members know and educate them on how well guideline developers are doing um, on particular standards. We typically have a featured uh, analytics, uh, so for this quarter we did literature search. And then we provide a brief explanation of the standard, and then we provide a graph to show you the mean by clinical specialty. The additional standards we've done this year so far are on um, financial COIs and on patient and public perspectives. So now I'm going to go ahead and log in. Now, because I've already registered, and Lisa in the next session will be going through our registration steps, um, the home page is going to refresh. And I have a new section. So our new content section features the six most recently posted guidelines to our repository. If you click the View More, you can access a page that has all the guidelines that have been posted within the past 30 days. We post guidelines at least twice a week, so this section is continuously being refreshed. I'm going to start with a simple keyword search. This is our search results page. Each search result includes the title of the guideline, the guideline ID or unique identifier, the publication date of the guideline, and then the guideline developer or developers. We then provide access to the different products that are available for that guideline. So as you can see on this page, some of the guideline briefs and trust scorecards are grayed out. And that's, again, because either the guideline does not meet the full inclusion criteria or we have yet to secure that permission agreement with that guideline developer. And if you hover over each of these products, a light box appears and it lets you know um, the reason why that product is not available. We offer filters on the left-hand side. The first is a toggle, so you can filter your results set by guidelines with briefs and scorecards and those without. You can also narrow your results set by publication year, organization, patient age, clinical area, and intervention. You can also sort your results set. It defaults to relevance. You can also sort by publication year. And then a new feature that we just launched earlier this month is our export citation feature. So you'll see next to each guideline there is a checkbox which you can use to select um, guidelines that you want to export the citation of that guideline brief and or guideline if it does not include a brief. You can also select all of your um, results in the in your results set. So I'm going to go ahead and select some and when I do so you can see that my export selected citations button is now active. I also have a banner down here that indicates to me how many results I've selected to export. I can also select all results from this banner and export the citations from this banner. As I scroll down the banner is sticky. It stays with me or as I paginate through. And as you can see, my results continue to accrue. When I'm ready to export my citations, you can do so again from this banner or from the button at the top of the search results page. 
This window is um, letting you choose which file format you would like to export your citations into. We offer RIS, XML, CSV, and plain text. For each of the file formats, we provide a brief template of what your, uh, is going to be contained in the export for each guideline. Um, those with guideline briefs we list first, and then those without briefs. Each one of the export formats, these templates change for, the, for that particular format. I'm going to go ahead and select RIS and click the export button. When I do so, I get a notification that my export is successful, and then you can go ahead and open up your export file. And again, this can be used for your purposes or for upload into a citation management tool. So now I'm going to show you a guideline brief. At the top of the brief, we have a lot of the same identifying information that was on the search results page. We have the title of the guideline, the guideline ID, again, the publication date of the guideline, and the guideline developer. We also provide the bibliographic citation of the guideline and a link to PubMed when available. You can print this guideline brief or use this feature to save it to, to, as a PDF. And then here's where you can access the full text guideline that's available on the developer's website. You can also access the trust scorecard directly from the top of the guideline brief. You do not have to go back to the search results page. So I'm not going to get into too much detail about the guideline brief. Lisa's going to be going into the different sections and fields that we're capturing in our next session. But I just wanted to let you know there are five main sections of the guideline brief, and we do provide this easy navigation on the left-hand side so you can jump to your particular section or field of interest. Those five main sections are overview, recommendations, methods, related content, and our copyright disclaimer. This is our trust scorecard. We provide the same identifying information at the top of the scorecard as we do for the brief to bring harmonization between the brief and scorecard for this particular guideline. And then here is where we actually have the scorecard and the IOM standards that we are assessing. Again, Lisa will get into more detail about each of these standards in our next session. Um, I just want to mention that uh, three of the standards, we have a yes-no option, and then the rem remaining, um, we are doing a one to five star rating. If you hover over each of these standards, a light box appears. Um, this is providing a brief explanation of what ECRI is looking for when we go to assess that standard. So now I'd like to um, show some other ways that you can search the website. If you do an asterisk, this will bring back the full repository of guidelines that available, are available on the site. As you can see, we have over 1,300. And then from here, you can use the filters to narrow your result set. If you know the guideline ID, you can search by that number, and it'll bring back your guideline of interest. Uh, when searching by multiple terms or phrases, the result, your result set is going to contain guidelines that include any of the terms um, anywhere in the guideline brief and or in the title of the guideline or source of the guideline if there is no guideline brief. You can do exact phrase searching by using quotation marks. Again, this is searching the guideline title and the guideline brief for those that have. And for those that do not, it's looking at the guideline title and um, we do have the bibliographic source. Uh, we offer searching by wildcard and truncation characters. So for example, if you wanted to do truncation at the end of a term, um, you would use the asterisk. So for this example, it's going to bring back guidelines um, where it identifies the term survivor, 
or survivors or survivorship. We offer Boolean operators, um, searching with Boolean operators of and, or, and not. I'll just show you a quick example. Um, so this, this, in this example, um, the results are going to include guidelines that contain, of course, diabetes or diabetic and also contain prevention or prevents or preventable or prophylaxis or prophylaxis or prophylactic. And then finally, we offer proximity searching when you desire results where your search terms are located near each other. So in this example, your results are going to contain guidelines where diabetes occurs within four words of management in any order. All this information, including additional examples, are available from our search tips page. You can read this at your leisure. And then finally, um, I just wanted to uh, mention that we also just launched um, an FDA alert notification um, feature on our website. So from the menu, when you are logged in, you can access our FDA notices page. So our team here received FDA notices, and when those notices um, relate or affect guidelines within the repository, we will post them to this page. Each one of these notices links to the um, FDA website where you can read the full notice. We just provide a brief description here. Um, additionally, uh, when if a notice has been posted since your last login, um, when you do log in, we do have a red banner um, that appears that lets you know that there is a new FDA notice that has been posted to the page. So with that, um, I'm done with the tour of the ACRI <laughs> Guidelines Trust website. Um, and I'm going to pause here before we move on to Lisa's session just to see if there are any questions. Hey, and there were a couple uh, that came in while you were demonstrating. Okay. How complete is the database for guidelines that do not meet all inclusion criteria? Do you mean? In terms of account, and okay, so if I just here, I don't know if you can still see my screen. So we have 806 here that um, do not have briefs and scorecards. So we don't exactly have the differential count between those that don't meet and those that we're still working to secure um, that permission agreement. Because we often get permission agreements from developers um, on an ongoing, well, we do get them on an ongoing basis. So we never really keep a count of the link outs, which we call the link outs to the full text guidance, yeah. because seeking this permissions agreement from the developers are, is an ongoing activity. And it does take time. For uh, the inclusion criteria, would you consider adding a quality appraisal? I assume the, the um, um, user is asking for a quality appraisal of the evidence, and the answer would be no. Okay. If a guideline is older than five years but has been reaffirmed more recently, would it, it still be included in uh, the guidelines trust? Um, the mm -hmm. uh, users yes. thinking about ones that were created years ago but reaffirmed more recently. Yes, um, that is something that um, I believe NGC used to have that process. The Guidelines Trust does not. So the guideline does have to be updated and republished. And what we do do is for those guidelines that we know will be what we say aging out, we provide the guideline developer with notification. Mm -hmm. And I believe we did that in June of this year to let those developers who had guidelines um, represented at our site that their guidelines would be taken down by the end of this year um, unless they were updated for current.
currency. So that's a service that we do offer the developers, letting them know when their guidelines are ready, um, and again, giving them about a six-month time frame that their guidelines will be withdrawn. And do you keep just one version of the guideline at a time? So if there was an update uh, before the five years, would you replace the older guideline? Yes, we would. And how, how do you know when, if there's an update before the five years? Do, do either the, the guideline developer, you? oh, I'm sorry, yes. Um, either the guideline developer reach out, reaches out to us and notifies us, but we also here we are continually doing searches for guidelines um, and updates of guidelines, and we monitor developers' websites. And uh, is there an export lim limit for the number of guidelines that can be exported? No. Okay. Those, those are all the questions um, from the chat box right now. And uh, we'll have one final time for questions at the end of the presentation. OK. Hi, everyone. This is Lisa Haskell. I am going to uh, go through uh, a little more in depth on the guideline brief, and then I'll talk about the uh, trust scorecard. So I'm not really planning to read what's on these slides. I will uh, let you uh, read that. I think they're fairly self-explanatory. Uh, here we're looking at the overview page. Um, and this will provide you with the guideline topic and the patient population. You may be able to get the guideline topic, of course, from looking at the title of the guideline. But it's not as often that you will be able to determine what the patient population is. Uh, this information is just to help uh, users who want to get an idea uh, whether this particular guideline is relevant, is something that they would like to take a better look at. So we're going to move on to the uh, guideline recommendations. Uh, this is arguably the most important part of the guideline brief for most readers, and that is why we lead with it. Um, we will uh, include the recommendation statements. They are copied verbatim from the original guideline, uh, and uh, we will put them in the same order. Where the guideline uh, provides the information, we will also include the quality of evidence and the strength of the recommendation, which you see here is in bold type. Looking still at what else is in this particular area, this particular field, uh, we have the evidence recommendation rating scheme and the recommendation rating scheme. Uh, this is helpful because uh, when you see the ratings on the guidelines above, this will give you a better idea of what uh, the guideline considers a high quality of evidence. Uh, also, what would be required for a recommendation to be rated as strong. In addition, the IOM definition of a clinical practice guideline includes an assessment of the potential benefits and harms that are associated with implementation. So where we can determine those, we will list them in the guideline brief. Um, I should mention that uh, this, uh, the introduction of benefits and risk when we first started asking for them was something of a challenge for guideline developers uh, because they generally thought that uh, their guidelines only had benefits and they were very reluctant to uh, determine whether there were any risks or not. So this has been something that uh, we've been able to build up over the years. So we're going to move on to another section of the guideline brief, which is the methods. And for researchers, it's often the guideline methodology that they really want to see. You can see that this section is organized under various headings, literature search, study selection, quality assessment, external review, updating, and patient involvement. Those headings correspond with uh, IOM standards. So we keep them in the same order uh, as they appear in the IOM standards. This is a way um, 
to, by presenting this information, we hope that it gives readers a better understanding of uh, where, where that information goes in the trust scorecard and perhaps some insight into the various ratings that are provided. Continuing with the methods field, we include the guideline funder, the guideline development group, and any information that's provided about their financial conflicts of interest. Um, in this also, these, these fields also correspond with IOM elements. And this section really aligns with one of IOM's goals, which was to bring transparency to the guideline development process. Moving on to another section of the guideline brief, we're talking about related content. Here we have supporting documents, uh, which are often uh, of interest to researchers who want to get a better idea of how a guideline was developed. Do they want to look at the evidence tables? Implementation tools, these are tools generally geared towards clinicians. You can see in this case that this particular one uh, was available in many languages. We will list those. Uh, and if there are patient education tools that were designed to accompany this guideline, uh, we will also link out to them here. I should mention that when you look at the evidence profiles, um, the link will go directly to wherever this information is housed. It may be at the developer's website. It may be at a journal website. But we will take you through to wherever you can find it. And finally, we're, we're at the guideline uh, briefs copyright and disclaimer section. The copyright will indicate that briefly that the guideline brief and the trust scorecard are protected by copyright, and they cannot be re reused or reproduced without permission from ECRI. Similarly, we acknowledge that the guideline developer holds the rights to the original guideline and any supplementary materials. The disclaimer essentially says that healthcare professionals have the responsibility to determine whether the guidance that's provided is appropriate for their specific clinical setting and patient. And I'm going to move on to my last slide. Oh, I'm sorry, trust scorecard. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, we're going to talk about the trust scorecard now. Uh, as was mentioned, um, the trust scorecard takes a look at the extent to which the guideline adheres to the standards uh, put out by the IOM, the Standards for Trustworthiness. At the top of the trust scorecard, we break into multidisciplinary uh, guideline development group members, methodologist involvement. Uh, these are rated as yes, no, because in this situation, it's really difficult to determine the extent to which a guideline development group is multidisciplinary. It is very difficult to determine the extent to which a methodologist was involved. So in order for us to make this operational, we really had to just decide to make it a yes or no. Uh, the guideline development group is either, from what we can tell by looking at credentials and affiliations, is either multidisciplinary or it's not. If it's uh, not, then it gets a no. Similarly with methodologists, we take a look and we determine if the methodologist is named in the guideline, which is often the case, we can say yes. Uh, if no methodologist is mentioned, we would give a no. Uh, developers are free to correct this information uh, and will review the trust scorecards before they go. Um, and if they will provide us with documentation, we will often change the no to a yes. Looking at the next one, incorporation of patient and public perspective, this is rated on the one to five. Uh, one being the least, one star is the least amount of adherence, and five being the greatest 
extent of adherence to the ILM standards. Moving on to what would be the area for the systematic review of evidence, we would be looking at the literature search, the study selection, and the evidence synthesis. These are all rated on a one to five uh, uh, standard. Moving on to the foundations for recommendations. This would be the strength of the evidence grade, the description of benefits and harms of recommendations. You may remember when I went over the brief that this was some of the, some of the areas that I covered, and a summary of evidence supporting the recommendation. Now these uh, areas uh, are included in the inclusion criteria, so it's likely that anybody who uh, has met the inclusion criteria will do better on these particular ones because we've already checked that before they're accepted. Strength of recommendation ratings, I included the, I showed you the recommendation rating scheme which we include, uh, and clear articulation of recommendations. This is uh, where we look at the actual recommendation statements and we assess the extent to which they recommend what is being done for whom, under what circumstances. We want the language to be clear, clearly articulated so that uh, there's, the direction is obvious. Funding source and disclosure and management of conflicts of interest. The funding source is another yes-no entry. The source of funding is either identified or it's not. Uh, in terms of the disclosure for, uh, co for financial conflict of interest, this is a rated one to five, depending on whether the developer has a process in place to determine financial conflict of interest, how detailed it is, and whether it is documented. This part of the scorecard looks at external review and updating. For external review, we look to see whether the guideline was reviewed by persons not directly involved in the development of the guideline. Developers can upgrade their rating in this area by posting the draft guideline for public comment and describing their process for incorporating that feeding, that feedback. Updating for this standard we check to see if there is an actual process for reviewing guidelines and determining whether they should be updated. And we would like to see a timeline attached to that process. Okay, now, finally, for my last slide. We're putting up, um, we have a multi-step process for registration. And here we have provided the steps uh, that will take you through that. And uh, we hope that this is something that you would share with your colleagues to encourage them to sign up for this free, uh, publicly accessible repository. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, if you have any questions on how to register, uh, you can uh, go to the guidelines.ecri.org and uh, you'll see that there that there is a sign in, and um, that should help you. Who creates the guideline brief? Is it developer provided or a collaboration with ECRI? Uh, the guideline briefs are created by staff here at ECRI uh, and the trust scorecards. And those, both of those uh, products are sent to the guideline developer for review prior to uh, the time that they are posted. Once the developer has them for review, there will be collaboration uh, back and forth uh, to uh, resolve any questions. Um, and uh, after that period, they will be posted to the website. And do the star ratings follow some type of rubric? Yes, uh, the uh, one star indicates the least amount of adherence, the lowest amount of adherence to the IOM standard. A fi five stars would indicate the highest amount of adherence 
to the IOM standard. Do uh, any of the guidelines include a patient education component? Is the patient ed c content something that will be developed more in the future? There is a patient education component in the guideline brief. Uh, however, if the guideline does not provide any patient education information, it will not be included in the brief. Where they do provide it, we will list it and link out to it. Great. So uh, folks, this is the last chance to ask any questions of our speakers. Uh, while I await any um, additional questions, I want to thank you all so much, Anne, Lisa, and Janice. Uh, this was a very informative webinar. Uh, it's definitely something that we have um, been asked for here at the network, um, what the replacement is for the National Guideline Clearinghouse, and um, I'm so happy that I ran into you all at MLA, and I really appreciate your generosity in speaking to us today. Yeah, we, we thank you all for inviting us to speak. Um, you know, we are going to be, um, as much as we can, we'll, we're going to be trying to um, be at conferences more now that we're up and running. So um, we will be posting any type of webinars or upcoming conferences in our newsletter. So if you sign up for EGT, you'll automatically get the newsletter. We'll have these postings. And for any of you that want to email us or have um, online, you know, conversations, feel free to email us. We can set up calls. We're more than welcome to talk to you. We know you're a big user group of guidelines, and we want to help you in your daily practice as much as possible. Lots of thank yeah, yous in the chat box and a f few additional questions. OK, could you, OK. Could you elaborate on how the literature search is assessed for the trust scorecard? Sure. The literature search, uh, we will look at the literature search to see if uh, they, how many databases they have used. We examine the search terms. We determine whether uh, the search appears to be reproducible. We are also looking for the dates of the search from, in, from the beginning to the uh, end date. Uh, we'd like to have the month and the year. And that's that for the search terms. I, there is a lot more that goes into looking at a guideline. <laughs> How long do guideline developers have to review the brief scorecard after it's completed and before it's posted? We initially provide them with a week. Um, and if they require additional time, it's simply a matter of asking us. And uh, we usually work with them on that. How do you maintain impartiality when consulting with the developers? Um, well, in terms of, I mean, it's not as difficult as people might think. Um, the, the guideline brief, the uh, elements that go into the guideline brief, as I said, there's really no question. They're either there or they're not there. We include the information verbatim where we have it. Uh, in terms of the trust scorecard, again, uh, we do have developers who come back to us and say, well, I think I deserve a higher score on this particular item. Uh, if they can demonstrate that they fulfill the criteria, for that particular item, uh, then we will raise the score. Uh, but in many cases, the developers uh, acknowledge that they did not completely fulfill the requirements. And uh, they end up saying, well, we'll do that uh, next time around. And many of them do. Uh, Lisa, I also wanted to jump in because some developers give us um, permission to post their content without having to review it. So yeah, we, have two, we have two instances where Developers either want to review their brief and scorecard prior to posting. Others that, you know, many of these developers had longstanding relationships with us. They choose to just let us go ahead and post without their review. Well, I think I have asked uh, the questions in the chat box. Um, lots of thank yous, uh, very informative. Thank you for making it available for free and making it easy to locate trusted guidelines. 
And uh, somebody asked, do you have to create a login? Uh, yes, uh, I think I know the answer after watching this webinar. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, you must register for free access yeah, to this uh, resource. Great. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, thank you all uh, participants for your great questions and your participation uh, in this webinar. When you close uh, WebEx uh, and when we end the session, you'll be redirected to the evaluation, which you can fill out to get your one hour of MLA CE. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel. Select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.